Detecting and responding to threats in the cloud is harder than doing it on-prem. Even when you do have the visibility you need, legacy security workflows weren't designed for the speed and complexity of cloud environments. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to spot threats across the hybrid attack surface, provide detailed investigation steps, and help you automate response. Request your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Well, welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Are you going cloud native? See how to integrate application security in our next webcast with Signal Sciences. Also an upcoming webcast, learn how penetration testing reduces risk in our May webcast with Core Security, a help systems company. Register for upcoming webcasts or virtual trainings by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. You can also access our on-demand library by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. Can you? I, there's a little bit of work going on in a migration uh, that's happening currently. You you can. I, I updated them all this morning. Okay, good. I know uh, the team was, was working on that. And they were like, where are the videos? I'm like, wow, I'm really glad that I wrote all those scripts to download all of our videos. <laughs> and so we have <laughs> we have all the content. Uh, we did lose a drive that had some of our, our backup stuff on it. So we had to pull from some different sources. Uh, backups of backups are important, right? So... Uh, we do have all those, so make sure you check out the on-demand archive. You get one CPE credit for every webcast or virtual training. Uh, Mark Orsi is here with us today. He is the president of Global Resilience Federation, a nonprofit with the mission to develop and support threat intelligence and information sharing communities, including financial services, retail, professional services, energy, transportation, and healthcare. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Uh, glad to be here. Good this to be is with Paul. You. Sorry. That's Paul. Yeah, <laughs> we we had him we had him switched around earlier. On yeah. The, on the... <laughs> oh, I thought you said all right, sorry about that. No, that's okay. <laughs> we we introduced it quick. Uh, so, Mark, it's great to have you uh, on the show. Um, so, Mark, what uh, tell us a little bit about the um, community effort that you have going on? Sure. So, we are, as you mentioned, a nonprofit with the mission to develop and support threat intelligence and information sharing communities. Uh, you may be familiar with FSISAC, that's an information sharing and analysis center. We currently support 13 communities across financial, retail, professional services, energy, transportation, and health. Uh, prior to GRF, I worked at Goldman Sachs for seven years working on data protection, big data approaches to behavioral analytics, threat management. Uh, then I worked for KPMG for a few years, but I worked with multiple organizations, in some cases establishing an entire cybersecurity program from soup to nuts. Uh, and then I was the, the product owner of data protection at J.P. Morgan Chase. It's great to be part of GRF now, where it can help thousands of organizations establish a collective defense against emerging threats. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about that if you'd like to, to learn more. Yeah, sure. Let, let's start with that before we talk a little bit about the work from home stuff. Sure. So in collective defense, if we receive an alert from one or more members in a community, we can share it out to all the members as potentially targeted attack on that sector. The more members we have, the more sensors we have in the environment for those emerging threats. So this effectively multiplies the detective capability we have and the effectiveness by the number of members that we have in the community. So it's much easier to identify emerging threats uh, with this view across multiple organizations. So in our communities, we use a hub and spoke model uh, to help the organizations we serve. So our analysts work with the members that submit information about a threat or incident where they were impacted, and we analyze and help the member remove any identifying information, and then we can share that out more widely. And so we've seen this really work, um, and we've, we've seen cross-sector sharing where we've actually had indicators of compromise come in. We've worked to, to share them out to multiple communities, and then they were effectively able to prevent that attack from occurring a day later. That's awesome. And Mark, what I love about that is Oftentimes, I think the reason why people don't share things is because of the extra work involved in sanitizing it or anonymizing it, right? I, and I'm guilty of that myself. In fact, oftentimes I won't share some code right away because I'm like, I need to clean it up and, you know, make some changes so that keys and other things aren't, you know, floating around and, and better protected. The same thing with data. You know, just sanitizing that is usually uh, one of the reasons why people are reluctant to share, right? So help with that yeah, is great. It's hard when you're in the middle of an attack or in the yeah. middle of a crisis to actually um, implement that, that information sharing, but it should be part of your processes so that it's, it's standard um, and you can really help protect the entire community and then benefit from it on the other end as well. Agreed. 
Yeah. Mark, today you wanted to talk about the work from home and the business uh, impact and security risks. Certainly, it's a topic we've been uh, discussing on many of our shows. Uh, so we wanted to get your take on it. Sure. I mean, first, you know, setting the stage, right? Most organizations were not prepared for this type of event. Um, I think you can see that across every industry and every sector. The types of planning that were done, continuity planning, pandemic planning, uh, previously expected like some time of con containment or constraining the event to a few locations, but businesses that have effectively risk management, uh, effectively implemented risk management and business continuity planning, they still only prepared for 10 or 15% of their workforce to be remote for a period of time. This kind of event where we had this widespread impact for sectors uh, that still operate and require up to 100% of their remaining workforce to work remotely for a minimum of months and, and maybe over a year, uh, we're, we're seeing that as, a, as a, a huge shift and a huge impact to businesses. And so, Mark, how do you, you know, as you talked about it, right, to only prepare for 10 to 15 percent. Um, when we get out of this crisis, what kind of changes do you see to continuity planning going forward, right? I mean, this is, it's really kind of a black swan event when we think about it in the in the larger scheme of things, right? It's something we never anticipated, not only the size, but the duration. Does that change the way we have to think about continuity planning going forward? Yeah, I think it does. And I think we need to think about our supply chain. And, and even coming out of this, we need to think about um, a new position of supply chain risk manager, for instance. But you know, even though we're working on hundreds of medical trials of vaccines, antivirals, treatments, um, and we're flattening the curve as, as we can see and we hear about, um, we, we still know that this is, is as um, infectious as it was when it first was introduced. There's been recent modeling by Harvard School of Public Health that suggested there's gonna be repeated waves of social distancing that may be required. And, and so that's what they're talking about, reopening the economy, but really preparing for repeated waves of more control and then letting the controls go and then applying more control until we have effective treatments. We see this widespread, you know, global turn down, um, widespread GDP impacts of up to 3%, um, worse than spread depression. So, you know, how are we managing those changes and what, what do we need to do to plan for it? Um, even if you had a pandemic plan in place, you should be really working to understand your immediate exposure, evaluate your operations and supply chains um, for multiple scenarios, identify your potential points of failure. Uh, I think people should really be working to refresh and tailor their pandemic and continuity plans, developing an operating model for the crisis, um, defining those trigger points, the required resources you have and specific actions to take. And if you don't have a plan yet, um, there's CDC's pandemic uh, planning checklist, and there's FEMA's continuity planning templates that you can use as a baseline. Uh, I also encourage you to read, McKinsey had a, a great report, um, which goes into a good amount of detail where they're, uh, they're specifying for larger organizations, for instance, creating a task force with five teams, 18 work streams focused on employees, supply chain stabilization, customer engagement, stress testing, and operations. And that's, their recommendations were in line with other firms that we saw uh, from KPMG and Bain and others that, that we saw as well. You know, one of the big impacts here is obviously the, the remote nature of, of people, you know, not on premise anymore, right? Uh, which creates some interesting challenges from a threat intelligence, threat sharing perspective. Um, uh, you know, what do organizations, what should organizations be doing to continue to monitor for threats and attacks in this really distributed remote environment that we weren't really set up for? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, being part of an information sharing community is great uh, because it also allows you to share best practices with organizations that are the same size and shape as yours. Um, so that is one way that you can get guidance from other people. If you think about sort of the pyramid of information sharing, uh, you know, there's, there's CISOs that meet quarterly and they talk about best practices and controls that should be introduced. There's the, the lowest level, which is sort of machine to machine information sharing of indicators of compromise um, that can maybe uh, uh, immediately 
uh, be applied to your security controls. And there's a middle layer of, of information sharing where we really focus, which is, you know, in that threat analyst looking and aggregating all the information from the different sources and then talking about, you know, what are the controls and best practices and things that we need to do, um, you know, for our organization. How can organizations better plan for remote access and do that securely, Mark? I know there's a, a lot of factors in it, but, you know, that's the one that I think we keep coming back to on this show. Yeah, remote access, I, I think there's a lot of things that we need to do um, to, you know, help our employees understand basic security hygiene, right? Um, providing them straightforward guidance, uh, really educational awareness, uh, being in, in data protection in the past and data loss prevention, education of our workforce was the primary way to help uh, reduce risk. So providing the straightforward guidance for them on their remote, remote working solutions, the risks they have, uh, the context that they need for help and, and reporting any issues, um, really educating them to be aware of privacy, securing their environment. Um, there's physical things they should be worried about, making sure uh, they have a clean desk and they've, you know, locked the room they're in. They're not in the, in a, uh, in some other place where, uh, they could be shoulder surfed, for instance, um, using strong, unique passwords updated regularly, keeping work and home devices separate, uh, connecting via VPN or other secure mechanism and using secure Wi-Fi access points. Um, and then all the educational thing around, you know, be careful what you open, use your strong, unique passwords, make sure, um, Certainly, if, if you have employees that have the capability to move money, uh, that should be verified, validated, um, maybe two pairs of eyes before making any transaction. Um, limiting your remote administrative access, backing up all files, and storing a, uh, a remote copy external to your systems. All the basic security hygiene becomes more and more important as the attack surface grows and we have uh, you know, police uh, people in, in their homes or in unsecured Wi-Fi uh, environments. Um, really just increasing your attack surface area. Yeah, yeah I think it, you, you know, it it, go, it puts some of the re more responsibility on the employee and the person, right? Because once they step outside of that corporate headquarters and boundaries, you lose a lot of those protections that are kind of inherent and built in, right? And so I think you're right, Mark, as much as I, I don't like putting too much responsibility of security on the user, in this case, we're almost forced to have them be more aware and have maybe better or different procedures when they're working from home. Yeah, I think there's also, you know, controls and there's new solutions that have come out. And I was even in the past week talking to different vendors about um, there's there's new capability, I think, that's emerged over the last few years. Uh, we were talking about it um, at JP Morgan. We were talking about it uh, at KPMG, um, where... You know, we're able now to protect data wherever it is uh, because of, of pervasive uh, and widespread ability to connectivity uh, and key management that can be done now. You can actually start to protect your data wherever it resides. I can see a shift toward those kinds of solutions. I think it's, um, you know, if we talk about what should organizations be doing and what should they be thinking about in some of their uh, new technologies and um, maybe some of their current initiatives, accelerating them to help protect uh, the workforce, protect the data wherever it resides. Agreed. We've talked about those those same technologies as well. Mark, what have you seen from the, uh, speaking of technologies, from the remote access standpoint, I know that Aruba, uh, now HP, right, used to have like, if you could give a, a user an access point that could take it home and it would build the tunnel for them and give them a secure Wi-Fi uh, access uh, to corporate headquarters. Um, are, are there still technologies out there like that today? And do you see, I see those increasing. Uh, I'm not sure if you do as well. Yeah, I do as well. I, I, I again, I was talking to multiple vendors um, about some of their secure solutions that, you know, potentially replace VPNs. Um, mm -hmm. I think there, there's absolutely the reliance today on connecting via VPN or other secure mechanism. Um, and using secure Wi-Fi access points where you can, you know, using multi-factor authentication where possible. Um, all of these things that, sh that should be planning. And, you know, if you think about what should CISOs be focused on, um, you know, there's a whole, whole list of things that they should be thinking about. You know, what are those key themes that they've been thinking about um, and, and how do they refactor and re 
prioritize them for the resources they have on hand and and for this shift to the work from home environment. Matt? Yeah, Mark, you know, you're in uh, a, a unique position from an information sharing perspective. What kind of trends have you seen from the attack vectors? What, what, what is, what's happening in this environment that organizations really need to be aware of? Yeah, so we've seen um, really cyber criminals. They've been working hard. They've been rapidly building out infrastructure to launch COVID-19 spear phishing attacks, create false websites that look like the Johns Hopkins dashboard, for instance. Um, and they're working to collect credentials, like create these websites that'll give you the information once you um, once you enter your password, right? And we've also heard of preparations for post-pandemic ransomware attacks on specific industries. So they're, those threat actors are actually preparing for when the economy rebounds and the people could pay ransomware, for instance pay the ransom, uh, for instance. Um, but, you know, you have that increase in, in your attack surface. Uh, there's eavesdropping op opportunities, man in the middle opportunities with unsecured Wi-Fi. Um, there's the, the mixed use of business and personal email. So you have that, um, that as a potential threat as well. Um, from a phishing, I think recently Microsoft Security Intelligence um, had a campaign that they were monitoring where nonprofits were offering free COVID-19 tests, for instance, um, and those contain TrickBot and there was Emotet malware that was contained as well. Um, health organizations, um, uh, health organization precautionary measures, fake tests, fake copies of the websites, like I mentioned, um, service disruption advisories. Also with the stimulus coming out, there's a lot of fraud and, and uh, scams that are focused on getting in the middle of that, that stimulus. Um, and fake identities where people are creating, maybe people had been creating fake identities and building them up uh, in the past, these uh, synthetic identities, uh, which maybe are machine-based, where they start to build credit and then they take advantage of them once they have enough credit to do it. Uh, they might be using those fake identities for, for programs like PPP, et cetera. I think the, the advice to all of your users should be, if it's anything to do with COVID-19, make sure you validate it probably twice. Yeah, I think uh, I, I love the idea of two pairs of eyes um, on, especially if there's any financial tra transactions, mm. um, you know, making sure you're not the, the only one, uh, the weak link in that chain. Yeah, I think one of the big challenges, you know, separating home and work email is kind of tough in some environments because you're using your home PC now potentially to do work because you weren't issued a, a corporate computer before everything happened. And, and so the ability to cross contaminate has to be a really big concern in this environment. And so, you know, it, it, even if it's not in your work email because you have uh, efficient um, email filtering technologies in place that, that work, you could still get infected because your home PC uh, and your home email doesn't have that same protection. That's exactly right. I think um, making sure, again, that's educating your workforce on best practices. If you have a separate device for work, that's the best way to go. And if you have that, if you're only using the, the, the VPN and the, the, um, the, the standard channels, uh, that are controlled, that's that's definitely the way to go. So again, you talk about sort of shifts. I think, um, you know, having worked for large financial organizations, again, uh, uh, who are always, you know, we're always, I think, a little bit ahead in the maturity of security um, than other industries. And so, you know, our move to the cloud has been kind of uh, uh, slow and precautious. Um, but even, you know, in the last couple of years, we were moving toward, you know, Office 365 and a lot of these types of solutions. And I just think that's going to be a dramatic and continued shift uh, to uh, SaaS type solutions. Because now the data may be more protected in those environments than they were, you know, in your own infrastructure. Yeah, and I think that will have a very interesting impact on threat intelligence, threat sharing. Because now you're going to start to see those attacks and those indicators start to shift from traditional on-prem, maybe now into some of these different cloud environments. So you'll probably start to see that trend in, in the kind of information and sharing across your member um, environment as well. Yeah, and the the other side of that coin, which is the negative, is is now those are you know larger 
those are larger targets for attack and potential impacts. So if one of those, you know, we've seen attacks too on uh, managed security services providers as well, because once uh, a, a threat actor gains access to those, then they can leap out to the other organizations that are clients. So we see those central hubs of services as also uh, you know, strong points of attack for these threat actors, and then they can you know, spread from there. Yeah, you talked about supply chain. I mean, if we think about not only our third party, but fourth and fifth party dependencies in that outsource chain, those also become really interesting concentration points for attacks in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I talked a little bit about having that supply chain risk manager, right? You're worried about uh, your vendors, your supplies, your third party risk. Um, and, and, you know, part of this too, I, I, I kind of go back to information sharing as well. Uh, you know, making sure that you're assessing the risk from your vendors is really important and foundational component of any cybersecurity program is information sharing as one of those many controls that are in the, the NIST and cybersecurity framework. Any, Matt, any other questions for Mark? No, I'm good. Thank you, Paul. Mark, anything else you wanted to uh, talk about today? Um, I think just, just as far as you know, CISOs, what they should focus on, um, I think making sure you've kind of identified your key themes, prioritized your resource and activities, making sure you have the infrastructure and capacity um, for what you need, uh, including that entire uh, that entire mobile workforce connectivity. So devices, laptops, again, you know, making sure they have their own uh, devices. Uh, VPNs, video conferencing becomes you know, key as well. Um, are all of these modes of connectivity secure? I think that's something you need to ask. Um, you know, making sure you have the appropriate scaling for your VPN concentrators, your portals, your gateways, um, or identifying alternative mechanisms for delivery for handling that large work from home workforce. Um, and you need to consider your suppliers, your contractors, your vendors, other folks that need access as well in that entire pool. Making sure you have adequate um, help desk operations capacity, they're trained to respond um, to the new types of queries that they're gonna be getting, uh, maybe more frequent login password changes, access uh, to systems. Um, making sure you can split your functions into those that are critical to ensure you have the capability um, and the capacity um, as you ramp as you ramp up your overall capacity, that at least your critical functions have the capabilities they need. Um, and then, you know, asking questions: uh, Should you whitelist applications, block not everything that's non-essential to meet the capacity that you need? Um, are you adequately testing and monitoring your capacity and connectivity across infrastructure, applications, and operations? And then, you know, how do you manage if a significant portion of your workforce or supplier staff are out of commission? What do you do if that crisis impacts you, if a large portion of your workforce is in a hot spot um, and they need to, to really lock down? You know, are you ready for that? Uh, yeah. So these are all things that, that should be considered for CISO and really for, for anybody who's, who's responsible for operations. You know, it's interesting. I had not really thought about if you have a knock or a sock or a help desk that normally goes into the office to do their jobs, right? how do they all work from home and how do they route phone calls and things if like if you weren't already set up to have your service desk kind of staff in any capacity work from home that's a huge both process and uh, technology challenge for an organization absolutely yeah and and all of these uh, you know you need to think about all of these uh, from that business operational perspective and resiliency perspective and whereas, you know, like I said, in any one of these crisis planning scenarios, people would think 10 or 15% of my workforce can handle the critical functions for, you know, the, the three weeks or four weeks during this crisis, and then everything will come back to normal. Well, this is a, a, an extended 100% mm. workforce work from home impacted event. And you need to take all of those planning exercises that you had done and reinforce them and look at all of the components of it. And so that's why I kind of pointed back to the FEMA crisis response and planning, um, some of those materials that already exist out there that you can use as tools to then go through your, uh, through your planning exercises and make sure that you've hit all the points that you need to hit. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and we may not return to normal, which is the other part of that assumption that has to be taken into account. 
Yeah, I, I, again, I, you know, go back to that Harvard study, right? And, and even with, you know, seasonality, even with increased capacity, you know, they were looking at this repeated waves and whether it's, it's across the entire country or in localities, um, you know, you, you're going to go through repeated waves of these events where you have tighter controls and they're lifted and tighter controls and then they're lifted until a, your herd immunity is reached or until you have, you know, effective treatments. So this could go on for many months. Um, I think we just need to be mentally and prepared for that uh, and hope for better, hope for an antiviral that comes out earlier, um, but really be prepared for this to be a, a, an extended event. And, you know, how do we reopen our businesses and economy um, in an intelligent, thoughtful way um, that, that, you know, still allows for that. Mm. Well, Mark, thank you so much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. And with that, we'll take a short break and come back with our next guest for this episode. Stay tuned.